That's the best. I haven't had chuckers in years. That's <laughs> so cute. Uh, good morning, everyone. And welcome to this very spe special Signal Studios event. Um, I'd like you, I'd like to thank you all for tuning in um, to this very special forum that we have produced for you here at Signal Studios. Uh, my name is Samira. I'm currently tuning in from the Signal Studios, which are based on the city of Melbourne. I know that right now we're all watching what is unfolding on our screens and what's unfolding on the news and what's unfolding on the streets. And I would like to thus begin that we are currently zooming in from all around Australia and all around Melbourne right now. Studios. Uh, my name is Samira. I'm currently tuning in from the Signal Studios, which are based on the city of Melbourne. I know that right now we're all watching someone right now. unfolding on our screens and what's unfolding. I think we have a little bit of Facebook feedback there. So I'm going to start again. My name is Samira and I am an associate producer here at Signal Studios as part of City of Melbourne. Um, we are currently right now zooming in on the lands of the Bunurong and Wurundjerung peoples of the Kulin Nation where Signal Studios physically sits. And just before we got a little bit of feedback, I was saying that right now, as we are watching what's unfolding on the televisions, on the screens and on the streets, it is important to remember that this has been, always will be Aboriginal land, that sovereignty has never been ceded. And I like to pay my respect to any Aboriginal elders, past and present, and for any Aboriginal participants that may be zooming in right now onto this panel. Like I said, I am Samira. This forum today is part of a year-long project called Female Futures. It is a collaboration with VicHelp. And basically it is a project designed to build the capacities and artistic development of young women and non-binary creatives here in the city of Melbourne. I'm gonna give a quick breakdown of today's forum. We are gonna do a morning panel first. Then we will have two afternoon workshops. For those of you who have registered for this, you would have received a Zoom link for those. If not, don't worry, by the end of this, we will paste it into the chat. Right now though, we're gonna have a really great conversation with the four panelists that you can see on the screen with me today. Um, we will have lots of time at the end for questions. So if you have them, please post them in the Facebook page, or if you're in the webinar right now in the chat, so let's start. Um, right now we have assembled four artists and creatives that are, in my personal opinion, fabulous. They're all key figures in their own respective careers. And it's a great pleasure for them to join me today. I am going to get them to introduce themselves in alphabetical order. Let's start with you, Arij. Alphabetical order. It's yes. a blessing and a curse. Um, my name is Areej and I am a producer. I work in audio. audio. I also teach radio. Um, I also want to start by acknowledging that we're here on, um, I'm personally on the Bumurong lands of the Kulin Nations. I pay respect to elders past, present and becoming, as well as anyone, any First Nations people who might be listening. I also acknowledge that right now is a really intense time for First Nations people and Black people around the world. And um, the arts is such an important sector that needs to really, really engage with itself and look at itself and see what it's doing to contribute to the, um, essentially the oppression of Black and First Nations people in this country and around the world. So I really just needed to get that off my chest. Um, I am a producer, I've worked in radio, I produce podcasts, I teach podcasting and radio at university. Um, I've also worked in curating um, art stuff, visual art stuff, performance art stuff um, around the city. I've done a bunch of work with the Signal as a um, someone who does little workshops, but also as a participant. Um, and so I'm really, really happy to be here to chat with all of you today with amongst like the greats, people that I think are so fantastic in this city. It's almost overwhelming to be in the same space we're not in the same room but the same internet space as each other <laughs> awesome my name is claudia um i i'd like to pay my respects as well to the traditional owners of the land i just i feel very fortunate to uh work and live here in this country and it's definitely something i uh, try and bring into all of my work practices just that yeah sense of gratitude 
Um, I am now most famously known as a film director. I started many years ago as a photographer uh, and also a performer when I was very young, uh, teaching dance. And again, I teach dance now, but in the last few years, directing music video clips and directing a feature-length documentary has been uh, what I'm most known for publicly. That's short and sweet. Take it away next. <laughs> I'm Melanie. Mel is also fine. Um, also would like to acknowledge that I'm on Bunurong land now um, and acknowledge the really difficult time that we are in at this moment. Um, I have been practicing on this land for over 10 years um, working in the arts and have been really fortunate to meet some really incredible traditional owners, emerging um, Indigenous voices and I'm very conscious of that in, in all of my arts practice. Um, I describe myself as a senior arts manager. Uh, I have worked across um, like a number of festivals in Melbourne, um, started off at Melbourne International Arts Festival as, as it was known then, now just been renamed to Rising. Um, then I moved over to the Melbourne International Jazz Festival where I was program director for seven and a half years. After that, I had a stint at MIF, the Melbourne International Film Festival where I was general manager um, and about 14 months ago, I went off on my own to be an independent um, consultant. I've been working across kind of executive production roles, some curator roles, some project management roles, um, a lot of kind of strategy and high level kind of engagement with arts uh, and culture. So that's kind of my background. I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> um, my name's Naomi. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm, yeah, speaking to you on Kulin Country, Wurundjeri Country. Um, and yeah, it's been a really tough week. Um, I think there's, yeah, it's just been unraveling in a, in a way that, um, I mean, it's always been urgent, but I just think we're in a time where things are compounding. And I hope that sharing um, the ways in which we work can really uplift people to, to take some action. So I'm really excited to see what we can chat about further on. Um, I have spent, um, yeah, around 10 years working in the arts. Um, I feel like I've had a number of roles, so um, never feel like, I feel like producer probably captures um, um, what I do now. And, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's a really multifaceted role and I've worked across a number of organisations. Um, Melanie and I have worked together a number of times, so at the Jazz Festival and also Melbourne International Arts Festival. Um, I currently work for a platform called the Australian Performing Arts Market as their program producer, um, but I also have an independent practice um, where I aim to build capacity amongst artists of colour who are kind of navigating um, the sector because it can be pretty pretty crazy and overwhelming um, and yeah really um, enjoy that um, mode of um, seeding new work and creating new work and seeing how that comes to be so that's me. Thank you all for that um, you're right Naomi it has been a tough week I think it's been a tough month it's been a tough year it's been a really weird year um, and my first question actually kind of is asking us to kind of look a little bit back when things were slightly a little bit more normal um, and I guess I wanted to get a sense of your all um, independent practitioners what does your average week kind of look like in your roles pre-COVID um, and I would like to start with you Naomi yeah, so um, I guess I, I I guess I work across two different jobs. I guess there's like my independent practice, and then there's also my three day a week job at APAM. Um, so I I um, APAM is very much um, just to give people a bit of context. It's essentially a function um, that sits with the Australia Council, and um, we work to um, I guess, promote Australian art to the rest of the world, um, performing arts. Um, so a lot of my day-to-day -day in that role is um, connecting with international peers and festivals and presenters um, and also Australian artists to, um, to talk about um, their work. Um, so it's been really um, interesting to kind of 
unpack what Australian art is in that context for me um, and sort of what, what we're speaking about and how we're speaking about it. Um, and obviously the, yeah, and so um, sometimes, yeah, part of my role involved um, traveling from time to time to um, other arts markets around the world. Um, but other than that, it's lots of meetings, lots of emails um, and kind of organizing a series of events. Um, I also work part time in that role because of my independent practice, but I also have a young child, which is also super impactful in my day to day. Um, he's two and a half. So, um, yeah, in and around that, it's also trying to go and see shows and performances um, in the evenings, preparing meals before I have to go and do that, all those types of things. So, um, yeah, my weeks are kind of um, three days kind of in the office. Um, and then two days, one day kind of full time with him and then another day of juggling kind of conversations with independent artists um, and the like. Yeah, that's me. Um, what about you, Mel? Uh, I've had a really interesting kind of, I guess, a lot of change in the last, for me, in the last 14 or so months since I've been working independently. Um, Prior to that, my my day today was actually very like normal office-y, I guess, for the arts. So it would be, I wouldn't say nine to five, more like 9.30 or 10 till 6.30-ish, um, five days a week. Plus, as Naomi said, um, certainly going to see a lot of shows and events um, in the evenings. I also used to do a lot of international travel, especially while I was at the jazz festival. I used to go and um, attend conferences and um, go to festivals all over the world uh, was an amazing part of the job, although it sounds a bit more glamorous than it actually is because you're working incredibly hard, hard um, in those contexts. But since going independent, it's kind of been an interesting shift for me. So I've been taking on some shorter contracts, which are generally short, quite intense um, projects. I did one over in Perth at the end of last year, so there was quite a bit of travel over to Perth with that. Um, and generally working sort of four to five days a week, depending on what the contract is, plus also some of my own independent things. So um, working with, I've been working in a kind of strategic way with some musicians, helping them in sort of artist management uh, type role. Um, often doing that in evening time when I'm not working on my other projects. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my structure. Structure, no structure. It's it's sort of flexible, but that's what's great about our industry, I think, is that there is a lot of flexibility in the way that you're able to work, setting of your own time and hours. Things don't have to happen nine to five, um, but you definitely do need to be available for weekends and um, evenings. Certainly when I was running a festival, it was, you know, many months without days off necessarily. Um, at certain points in time. So it can be pretty intense and then it can also be pretty relaxed depending on the time of year and the sort of cycle in which you're working in. Who would like to go next? Claudia? Uh, yes. I, I don't actually even remember life before now uh, as we're all talking about it, but um, if I'm thinking of the, the years, there's no, uh, there's no order to any of my days and any of the possible many activities or uh, things that I'd be doing. I guess it's often like a rotating spectrum of writing treatments, editing on set, um, creating sets, costuming, styling, teaching dance classes, having uh, many uh, creative meetings, which are usually just on the phone. Um, yeah, but it's there's no rhyme or reason. There's never been a lot of structure because I work for myself. So essentially that probably like email can, can sometimes just look like days and months on end of work where you're maybe I'm working, you know, 16 hours of a day. And then sometimes it's, you know, weeks of, just gardening or cooking or doing something that's totally, you know, compression release from all of that. For me, it's really interesting because now is a an extremely flexible time for me. So at the moment, I am not working for any kind of media institution. I um, there's not that much curating or programming that's happening for me, but 
I'm just thinking about what my schedule looked like, you know, at about October last year. And I was working three days a week in um, in the media industry, in radio. I was working at the ABC on Radio National and I was doing that three days a week. I was also presenting um, a show on Triple R, which is a community radio station, independent community radio station um, in Melbourne. And I present a three hour show um, which requires a lot of work, but you know, community radio is volunteer run. So we, we do what we can um, and really just being in touch with all of the different art stuff and most more specifically different black art stuff that was happening in Victoria around the, um, the country and even around the world. There were lots of moments where things would happen, you know, all the way over there and we would speak to folks who are over there and also festivals like Euron Boy Festival, particularly, um, I think it was uh, last year, brought a lot of First Nations artists to Australia and so speaking to them on radio about what it is that they do and really unpacking a lot of stuff as it relates to arts practice. I remember one of my first interviews with, was with Naomi. I know, that was it so was like two oh, and us, I don't know, two years ago or something. Oh my God. And no, we just heavily we sleep just, deprived. It was awful. No, it was fine. You were amazing. You were amazing. <laughs> I mean, you would have just had your paper, but you were great. Um, but really just unpacking and understanding the context of the art sector in Australia. Before that, I used to... Um, do a lot more curating and programming uh, with a group called Still Nomads and we used to run a whole heap of events. I still don't really know how, how we did it, to be honest with you, because it was so, so much, like lots and lots of stuff. And actually I worked with Naomi um, at Arts House with some of those projects as well, where we would try and gather as many of these young African artists who are out there doing the work and very rarely recognised, um, doing incredible, like exceptional stuff that isn't being done in this country. Um, and we would just give them a space to, to do it, right? And that meant a lot of time was spent kind of supporting artists who may have not had industry access um, and kind of putting them into these spaces where they will have to engage with production or they will have to engage with all the different elements of creating an art space. And so I think that for many years, I was just this support role and just hand holding um, lots of holding lots of artists hands and taking them through this process that isn't just, you know, people don't just know that off the top of their heads. It's something that needs to be learned and, and people need to be exposed to. So I think, yeah, that would have been a typical week for me a bit chaotic but you know loved it most of the time I just want to jump in and say if you're not familiar with Arisia show um tune in 9am <laughs> the rap for triple arts it's oh. amazing I love it I listen every oh, week I when I'm not in meetings so <laughs> the plug for Arisia there I mean I agree but I'm biased <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> stream bias over here um, Eric, I'm really glad that you said um, unpacking um, the arts industry. One of the reasons we're putting this panel and this forum together um, at Signal, I also co-produce with Asia, as you are aware, a program called Curators. It is a program where young people from all around Melbourne, not just the city of Melbourne, can come the first Wednesday of the month in the evenings, and they kind of talk about art, they work on creative projects. Um, and one of the focuses that I've had with Asia was one, increasing uh, people of color and black and young people that come to the program, but two, also increasing the kinds of opportunities that are available to them from the city, right? And young people in particular come to us really overwhelmed, particularly those that are about to graduate or have graduated. And I guess today, the panel and the forums is kind of around demystifying the arts industry, demystifying the kind of roles that exist, so taking a little bit of a step back, um, for many young people that come here, their first, I guess, exposure to the arts is actually, it's through education, it's through tertiary ed education, whether it's they're studying fine arts, whether they're studying marketing. Um, I'm going to start the question then first to you, Arij. You studied journalism. You also um, volunteered at various community radio stations. You were at uh, 3CR and you did projects with Still Nomads and other things. Looking back, do you think that education has been incredibly useful for you? Would you recommend different type of pathways? You're smiling, you're smiling a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's just so would complicated. You, but would you also kind of, I guess, think that there are different pathways to where you are right now? Yes. 
So I was 17 years old when I finished year 12 and my mum signed me up to do this. I think, I guess, you know, that break between finishing year 12 in October or whatever and then starting university in March, I just imagine that. She wanted to keep you busy. That's it. She was so tired of me at this point. So she signed me up to this program where a bunch of young people of colour um, just learned how to do radio. It was just, I don't know where she found it. I don't like, I, you know, whatever. And I end up doing this um, program and it's part of SIN, which is a student youth network. Um, it's a community radio station, a youth community radio station based here in Melbourne, um, located in within the campus of RMIT University, as well as the NEMBC, which is the National Ethnic and Multicultural Broadcasters Council. And they focus on, you know, multicultural broadcasting, community broadcasting mostly, right? And so they did this partnership and I just, you know, walked into that um, having no real interest in or, or care for radio and then of course being obsessed and in 2020 continuing my obsession like 10 years later um, and it was really interesting because I started journalism school like in the next March and everything that I was learning in journalism school was almost the opposite of what I was being taught so after um, working at doing some stuff at SIN I actually um, found paid work in radio when I was 18 years old at 3CR Community Radio. And I was doing these segments for breakfast and I was being mentored by this incredible person named Gab Reed, who's a kind affairs coordinator at 3CR. And she was telling me things like, listen, you know, we are an actively progressive radio station. We don't expect you to interview politicians. We know what politicians think. We know what the government thinks. I want you to really just find grassroots communities and focus on them. You know, it's not about being objective because objectivity isn't real. And in that same week at uni, they would tell us objectivity is the most important thing in journalism. And it was these constant conflicting experiences um, where I would be really privileging the voices of young people of colour and at university literally we're told to do the opposite. We're told to interview academics, we're told to interview politicians, we're told to interview people of in, in positions of authority and that was really like the opposite of what I was doing. So for about a year and a half I was feeling really conflicted with university. Eventually I finished my course um, and everything that I learned I am really grateful for but I also recognise that often universities are institutions and especially universities teaching journalism and teaching fine arts and curating and all of these kind of um, professions are run by people who may have been journalists in the past um, but also run by people who see the media landscape in one way and they don't necessarily see community radio or independent media um, as such an important element of that whereas for me that was the most important element. I eventually finished university and I did um, a thesis, I did honours, I did a year of honours and in that I wrote this big piece about Africans within the community radio sector um, and doing that introduced me to a whole bunch of people who started community radio in the 1980s in Sydney and it really gave me this sense of connection of like our histories of radical radio within the African community and if I didn't study university I don't think I would have ever had the, um, I probably would have had the curiosity, but I may not have had the resources to go go over to Sydney and interview these like elders essentially in our um, broadcasting community. And so it's bittersweet. I think learning journalistic practice is really, really important. It's important to be ethical. It's important to respect your sources. It's important to understand how, to, how the system works in a theoretical way and also in a practical way. But I also would always um, privilege the work of community radio and community media in Australia as the driving force for passionate, progressive, independent media. And I think that, um, you know, it's an interesting balance. If you have the privilege of being able to be tertiary educated as well, go for your life. Don't expect to get all the answers is the only mm. thing that I would say. Other things are important um, for your understanding. I think I might jump to Claudia next. Claudia, I think in an earlier conversation, you mentioned that you actually don't have formal training in film so I think maybe the same question to you um why have you decided I guess to go towards the non-tertiary pathway um I don't even know that it was a fully uh conscious purposeful decision <laughs> I started working in the jobs that I do now on micro level and, uh, levels when I was probably 16 working with an organization called Multicultural Arts Victoria 
and that was purely because I knew some of the people that worked there and they just knew I had a good eye, you know, with the camera. So by the time maybe you, you're finishing high school and you are thinking about what you might do, I was already in the lanes of doing the things. So uh, it just, yet yeah, never occurred to me. And the fact that I barely attended high school also was pretty obvious that I'm, I'm not great structural um, learning you know that's not it's not part of kind of it doesn't help me it doesn't it actually I would end up doing assignments you know where you in art where you produce a final piece and then hand it in and the person would ask for the folio and then I'd go back and make the folio that supported it you know I, everything was backwards so uh, it, it made sense just to me and my character that I would just keep working yeah I, and it's been quite difficult I found there's been a lot of humor on sets for me with my crews educating me even about like common terminology within film and film crews and the hierarchy you know I'm in the top position as the director and everyone under me is just having a field day laughing at me as I have no idea all of the rules and there are many rules to the hierarchy structures within film so that's been fun and I just take it as humorous and of course I've had to learn really harsh lessons in the way of either letting people down not doing it uh, in the most things in the most efficient way or just being technically limited so therefore not having vocabulary um, and in those cases maybe not being taken as seriously I mean definitely all of that's come up but I'm uh, yeah I, I wouldn't have learnt everything I had uh you know I think I've learned more from not doing school that's that's me personally um so I think I asked you earlier about what your kind of work week looks today I wanted to go a little bit backwards um around what you think was kind of not necessarily your big break because I think when we ask the questions about a big break we think about very big projects that you worked on or a big artist or like a big job opportunity you had I think in general what I want to know is what is something that looks quite small to other people but really kind of pushed you in the direction of your arts career today so to give an example of myself um, I started doing events about a decade ago, a decade ago in Sydney in African uh, films, but that I wouldn't necessarily say was my big break. I think my big break really was with Arij starting Still Nomads and then running events from a community perspective with other young African people, because that has kind of drawn me into the direction I am today, which is very interested in African artists, African collectives and audience engagement. Um, I might go to you, Mel. I guess my answer is also going to be a little bit back to the other question as well, because I think I sit somewhere in between those other two women that have just spoken. Um, I did go to university. I studied history. I did an arts degree. So actually nothing to do with, with art. I also majored in history. Yes. <laughs> no. um, but when I finished high school, that was the only thing I really loved, like that I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to do an arts degree and I wanted to study history. I also did an honours in history um, and did a little bit of politics. Uh, and when I finished university, the, I went and had, there was like a free careers counselling session as part of like the end of my course. And the person who I went and spoke to said to me, so, okay, you're going to become a history teacher. You'll become a high school teacher. That's like the career path for people like you who've studied history. And I sort of went, well, maybe, but I've, in my, my personal life, I had always been really engaged in art and culture um, I mean, I danced with Claudia when she was probably 14 years old. We used to go to dance classes together. Um, I've, I, I danced as a child. I used to attend a lot of um, music events with my family, with friends. Um, I went to the first ever Chunky Move performances that happened when Gideon was first starting them. So I've always been really engaged in arts and culture growing up. And when I finished uni, I was just like, that's what I want to do. I want to work in the arts and this careers council when I said well I want to try and get involved in, in arts arts and culture she said to me oh well you can't do that you don't have any experience there's going to be people who've studied creative arts there's people who've done fine art there are all these other people who have all these other skills that they've learnt from a tertiary perspective who are going to be ahead of you in the line if you you know when you hand your cv and who's going to want to have you know the history major studying just a general arts degree um 
my personality is that my response to that was no way and I'll show you. So um, I, after I did that, I actually, while I'd been studying at uni in between my, my undergrad and my honours, I'd uh, volunteered at MIF at the Melbourne International Film Festival. It was literally a cold call to the office. I happened to get the program manager on the phone. She told me that I should, I said, I want to volunteer. She said, you should call back when volunteer registrations open up to be an usher. And I said, no, I don't want to be an usher. I want to come in and do something in the office and get some experience of what it is behind the scenes. Just so happened she needed somebody. I ended up doing an internship with her for a couple of months in the lead up to and sort of during the festival that year. Um, so when I finished uni, I started applying for all these arts jobs and I had this volunteer experience in programming on my CV. I actually applied for the office administrator role at Melbourne International Arts Festival because that was the job that I saw and that came up. Um, they called me and said, there's no way you're going to get an interview for this. Thanks for applying, but you've got no experience as an office manager. So sorry, no. But we see that you've actually done um, some programming and we're looking for a programming assistant. Do you want to come in and interview for that role? which hadn't been advertised. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I went in, I did the interview. They called me back later that day and offered me the job. So it was kind of a very fortuitous way that I got into programming in the first place. It was actually literally a cold call to the MIF office, happened to get the programmer on the phone. Um, I had no experience in marketing or, you know, development fundraising. I sort of wouldn't have had any other practical skills, I think, for a lot of the other areas. But in terms of programming and curation, I'd kind of had that experience in my life just by attending a lot of arts and cultural events and being really engaged in arts and culture. So it was a really informal ex exposure to arts and culture that I, I think ended up getting me um, into it in a way, like as well as the volu voluntary experience that I had. Um, having said that, I feel like my university degree was critical to understanding how to be critical. Um, so I feel like the skills I learned in that arts degree have been very important to my career but I actually have no formal training in being a producer, general manager, um, curator. I've kind of picked it all up along the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, same question that I posed to Mel. Anyone else can jump in as well about their first big break but I think something that stands out for me that you're talking about Mel is you really just were passionate about the arts and culture you have to actually really also enjoy going to things like shows going to things like events and sometimes it's tiring but i think what keeps us going in this particular area is that kind of interest already in the arts and in the culture yeah one of the most amazing experiences i actually have and what i love most about i'll talk about the program directing job that i did at jazz festival it's an incredible amount of hard work a really small team working on a massive festival um it would be when the festival was on and I'd have an artist on stage at Bennett's Lane at the time, Bennett's Lane Jazz Club, and I would have the, the artist there playing and then I would turn around and look at the audience and I would just see the joy and the emotion springing from these people. And that was, I just kept thinking, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for that. I'm doing it for what it gives an audience to have exposure to this art. And my contribution to that is what feels so significant in what I do. I think because it harks back to this recognition of myself as being that audience member, which I still am, you know, all the time today, but I certainly was as a young child where I felt like the things I were exposed to shaped who I was becoming as a young person and, and as an adult and, and these things still happen. I still have these extraordinary experiences um, engaging with the arts and I just felt that that was such a powerful um, experience in my life continues to be a powerful experience in my life and I wanted to be part of the dynamic of that. I think the only thing I would add is um, I actually I went to university I did an undergrad I went to um, I actually did journalism and um, um, like a communications degree which encompassed like journalism and just general comms, marketing, PR, all that kind of stuff. But I hated it. I like really, really struggled through university. I just had a terrible time and basically never wanted to walk into another, like I finished it, but I, I just really, really didn't enjoy it at all and found 
um, I don't know, as you are, I was like, when you're young, noodling around in like music and a bunch of other things, I met, um, you know, peers that felt like I had um, a similar, you know, I guess similarities that actually felt like they meant something. And then through that, I um, ended up working, because I grew up in Perth, actually, of all places, um, working at the Fremantle Arts Centre and vol volunteering in their comms section, which a friend of mine, they used to just have a lot of gigs on and stuff. So that's where I kind of had my first little like moment. Um, but yeah, I, I think the tertiary system, um, I, I guess it just privileges certain things and, and they're not for everyone. So um, yeah, I think take it with a grain, a grain of salt, <laughs> some of it. And I think there are some skills that you can definitely learn, but I think I, th I think if you've got like heart and a bit of hustle, then you can kind of do do anything really. Yeah, and I think um, also something to consider for those of you who are tuning in. I mean, maybe, I might be wrong, but there isn't really in Australia a very specific degree that says this will be make you become an arts programmer. This will make you become an arts producer. And listening to all of you, um, there are various ways to get into the kind of job or the kind of career you want to. I think it's just kind of thinking about what are you interested in, lots of internships, just trying things out. Um, so a lot of you, you already know each other and um, your networks kind of overlap. Um, it is a small industry. Sorry, I know I keep smiling. It's because of a reach. <laughs> reach's face, there's something about that face. I can't keep a straight face. I'm so sorry, guys. You're all very um, welcome. <laughs> this is what I bring. <laughs> this, is, this is what you bring. Um, so, like I said, a lot of the things that you guys do overlap, and I'm not just talking about networks, but also in your jobs, in your careers, you know, you do everything from fundraising, grant writing, programming, we all have to kind of consider those things. However, what is one thing in your own personal opinion that you think doesn't get talked about too much as a, a, a skill set that you should have or a task that is constantly kind of asked of you? Um, so, for example, for me, I would always say that when we, networking, networking, when young people ask me, they think of it as this thing that you go, you meet people, you give your business card. I always like to tell them networking is also about the kind of relationships you make, particularly if you want to uh, head into the area of programming and producing. One of the big critiques I have in Australian programming is that it does seem like it's the same 20 to 30 people being programmed in various things, and it is a reflection of that person's own networks, et cetera. Um, I don't have a specific person that I want to ask this to. So yeah, what is the thing that you find people don't think about quite a lot? Mel, you raised your hand. Well, I'm just gonna jump in to say relationships. I mean, I come yeah. at this from a kind of interesting perspective because yes, from a programming point of view, absolutely, relationships have been critical. But in everything I've done in my career, whether it's trying to manage a sponsorship, whether it's, um, working with an advertising agency to set up um, a brand and kind of um, run a campaign, whether it's managing a team of, um, you know, 150 staff and 400 volunteers at MIF, it's all about relationships and being a good communicator and understanding people and being a good human I think are kind of the most critical things to anything you'll do in life and particularly like pertinent to our jobs, particularly when we're often dealing in an industry where things can be sensitive. Like I, th I can't remember who said it before, but you know, the time that we're in right now, like how is arts and culture contributing to making a difference to all of our lives um, and improving our social situation? You know, these are really, um, delicate and important conversations and questions and I think the role of an arts organisation or an artist or an individual within all of that is is to kind of raise some of these issues um, but the way that you then relate to all the people around you is something that's quite critical so we don't often talk about it necessarily but to me relationships is foundational and kind of fundamental to um, this industry. Yeah, and to add to that, I think um, I think there's often a lot of things that are often, like with anything are hard to talk about, and um, negotiating. I think negotiating in the arts is a is a really um, 
it's a really hard skill. Um, I think you, it, it is fundamentally built on relationships, but I think um, the nature of um, our office might be the foyer of a, of a gig, like, you know, the foyer of a, of a theatre show, or you might be at a gig and you run into someone and you really like their work and then suddenly that has to kind of turn into a deal, dare I say it, but I think some of those conversations can be, can be really tricky um, and some happen really fluidly and easily and other times they can turn into like not so great situations. Um, so I think like that negotiating and being open and having a level of transparency can be, is a really hard skill the sector more broadly has. Um, and yeah, I think even through sort of, pr process of processes of decision-making, I think are also something that um, for big institutions, um, Samira, how you are saying, there's the, that, that cycle of the same voices getting space. I think that's, that's so much to do with um, a bit of, yeah, transparency relationships, but also who's got the hustle and the skill to negotiate what they need and how they can present themselves in the right way. I think for me, one thing that is missing and has been missing um, for a long time in conversations, but also in the entire sector is consideration of audiences and considering who, what communities constitute valuable audiences. And I think within... Um, Australian arts, there is a very specific community that is probably privileged in terms of audiences, people who have the funds, people who might be a little bit older, people who probably are white um, and art appreciators. And when you really consider an audience, you know, if you're trying to sell tickets, if you want to have, you know, social media following or cloud or whatever it might be, you people often program to an audience in mind. And I think that often we don't consider who the audience in mind is. And there are very few conversations about expanding the audience, like Australia in the last 20 years, Victoria alone in the last 20 years, um, the makeup of the state has completely changed, right? The makeup of the whole country in the last 20, 30 years has completely changed. But I don't feel like consideration for audiences has actually really changed. And I feel like often, you know, I am very active in the sense of going to all of these writers festivals and film festivals and all of these um, spaces. Um, and I think for many reasons, you know, a big reason for that is because I'm super interested and really, really engaged. And really, most importantly, I just want to see all these Black artists that are brought from overseas or around the country and the films that are screened and all of that. But I also know that a lot of these festivals are not marketed to people who look like me, to be quite honest with you, especially these bigger institutions. And I think that a lot of these careers are not marketed to people who look like me. And I think that a conversation that is very rarely had when it comes to the arts is who the audience is. And if you don't have a conversation about who the audience is, that means you're not having a conversation about what the programming is, right? And I think that, you know, it's like the elephant in the room. Mm. <laughs> you know? And I sometimes I'm like, am I out of mind or is the sector out of control? Also on that, I don't think necessarily it's just about they don't know who the audience is. I think sometimes certain audiences and, you know, uh, people of colour, Black, working class audiences, young people, they get put into a too hard basket. Um, so there isn't enough investment or there is an assumption that I find, particularly as an African arts producer, that if a particular event doesn't go exactly how they want it for the African community, then that must be a sign that there is an issue with them as arts engaged audiences, rather than looking at it, maybe there was an issue with the event or how it was programmed or how it was marketed to young African people, if that makes sense. Exactly, that's 100% exactly it. And that's not just, you know, and that's for all kind of communities as well, right? Like I think a lot about how sometimes there are these incredible people who would be so amazing for lots of people to see. And then maybe I've gone to an event or I've heard about it through email chains or being part of, um, you know, all the mailing lists and stuff like that. And then I might go to the event, tell a few friends, whatever. And then six months later, when I tell people, oh, this person was in town for this thing, they're like, what? Like, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, if I knew that, I would be there. And I think that, you know, often, you know, organisations are just giving up and losing out on certain audiences. And I think that's something that should be discussed. Um, sorry. Um, do you have something to add, Naomi? No, no, no. I'm just, I, I tend to agree about audiences. I think 
Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like at the moment it's a really interesting question, but I'm not going to launch into a COVID moment. But I think it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I tend to agree that there is not enough conversation around audiences, but I also think that it's to do, you know, as a programmer, um, to do with uh, the, that, the problems around hierarchy and how, Deci yeah, decisions are made. It's all intertwined, I reckon. And if this bit's not speaking to this bit, which it kind of should be a full circle, but what happens is there's just a break in it and it doesn't really get um, filled back in in any way because people just want to make money or need to reach that box office target or, you know, need to do, do all these other things. So, yeah. And I think, I guess the, I think it's also just, like over the 10 years that I've sort of been working in this industry, it's like the con things have shifted so much. And I think there's a real moment where like similarly to your age, I think like not, not many people that look like me would have ever like persisted in a way. And I think there's, there's space for persistence to actually um, really say that like, that's not okay. Or how come you haven't included this? Whereas I think for a long time, it, it, it felt like, um, you just weren't empowered to do that in any way, shape or form. And like, yeah, I could easily say 10 years ago, I think um, I never would have felt that I would be where I am now, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, speaking of persistence, we did get a question coming in through our Zoom um, webinar chats. The question is, how do you keep yourself motivated working for yourselves and sticking to your goals? Motivation. <laughs> I'm gonna to go to you, Arich. No. Actually, um, yeah, go on. Actually, I'm just gonna quickly also say for those of you who are in the Zoom, please feel free to ask questions just in the Q&A chat. And if you're following along on Facebook, you can comment uh, your questions as well. I'm just gonna be really quick about this. I'm, you know, I don't think I can answer this question without thinking about the situation that we're currently in and how hard it is to stay motivated when you're not leaving your house. Um, and I think that that has actually been quite difficult, but also made me realise how exactly what Mel was saying, seeing the crowds and seeing the artists and seeing the people coming in to engage with, you know, a program that you've created or people who are listening to your show or people who are responding and giving feedback, that is like the beginning and the end of like the passion and the motivation for me personally. And I see that um, how difficult it is to stay motivated when you don't have those relationships right now and it's just kind of reminded me of how important of how important that is I'll also answer that one and say for me it's a deadline I work really well under pressure I work really well to a deadline um, that's great for running a festival because there is no greater deadline than that's your you know that day is your go day and it's going to be insane and you'll have not a moment to even blow your nose in that period so um for me, it's really about whether they're external or, you know, deadlines I set for myself. That's really how I manage to stay quite motivated to keep things, you know, moving and ticking along. Having said that, Arija, I totally agree with you. I think this period has been incredibly hard for motivation when we're all kind of quite isolated. Um, and even though I've been working independently um, and not, you know, I've done some sitting on some funding panels, I've done a whole lot of different things that have required a lot of me on my own working, um, always having that opportunity to ultimately have interface with other people, whether it be going into an office or, you know, actually going in to do the assessments of the funding round where you sit with everybody and, and discuss those um, applications. Those things have always been like the thing to look forward to or the thing that kind of keeps me engaged um, as an extroverted person for the most part, um, being isolated at home is quite challenging. Um, but I've discovered some introverted qualities I didn't realize existed within me before. So that's, that's the silver lining. Um, what about you, Claudia? I think particularly as an independent filmmaker, how do you stay motivated and on track with your goals when you're working on projects? Mm, I think, yeah, and I'm, I'm maybe uh, I work uh, on my own really I would say like 80% of the time, you know, which is a really 
different there's the there's the very small part where I start to maybe produce something and we end up on set which is a one day um shoot or two day shoot so I I think I'm fortunate that I was raised uh with really in a really creative environment you know I had parents that were artists and that's the best qualities that they brought to my life was being creative so it sort of runs in in the in the veins um and I wouldn't see myself doing the sort of nothing else that, that occupies my time you know it's that is they're all one in the same I've said this many times where if it's like making a meal and writing a script all feel at the same level of engagement and creativity and imagination you know so um I also am the kid that that does everything the night before it's due and gets an A and unfortunately I learned that in high school and I watch myself even now carry that very bad method into you know working life where as you said there's like 400 people about to arrive at a cinema and you're still exporting the film so I wouldn't teach that, but that's definitely. I feel I feel exposed and attacked. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a last minute person. I feel exposed. It's definitely not. It's I would never teach this, but somehow I think it's the way you you kind of worked when you were younger, even subconsciously. It tends. It's very hard to break those patterns. I've tried many times to have all other kinds of motivations. I don't even know the deadline will get me moving faster. So. There's an internal resilience that is uh, to ask the question before where I, I feel like something that maybe isn't spoken about and I would say all of you uh, women have this is just like your own personal resilience to show up um, and make commitments to make things and kind of be proactive in the in the world uh, when it's not always easy. You know, I, I just think having no one talks about the fact you have to have a lot of difficult conversations and you have, sometimes you feel really uncomfortable and sometimes you just don't want to do anything. You know, there's all these realities that kind of aren't, aren't part of the uh, framework. Most of the time, I think people are just more skill teaching, whereas, I, yeah, you're in the internal dialogue that you have to have with yourself continuously to go, that's right, that's, that's why I'm doing this. Yep, just keep going, you know. Um, we have another great question coming in. Please keep asking them. Um, this one is, how did you find opportunities in high school? I would also actually like to extend that because we do get a couple of questions coming in um, through text. How would you find opportunities through uni, post uni? Um, and I think I will open that up to anybody, but just to kind of, I guess, extend on what you were just saying, Claudia. It's one of those persistence things and proactive things, but also for my own personal history, one thing leads to another and unfortunately sometimes it's getting those first couple that is the difficult one you know that first art job that first um programming assistant at the melbourne you know festival but unfortunately that one thing leads to another and it does seem like it's certain people getting the roles but it's just that you gotta try you gotta keep building that resume yeah yeah i was like rejection is real man it happens and you gotta like it's true like as i learned to get rejected oh. too like, you know, and I think resilience is, is a big, big part of it. I mean, it's just so it's just a really competitive industry to be in. Um, and like most of the other people that you're up against are like, I don't know, it still can be really patriarchal. There's just like real kind of problems that I think come along the way that, um, yeah, that mean you you do need to, that it does happen and, and you you kind of just have to, get up and, and keep going but I think in terms I mean a lot of it is around volunteering um I think I just don't I reckon also don't ever underestimate the the people that are in your lives or the relationships that are just around you and how like I don't know you, you might just realize that um someone's mum does this thing that you've kind of always been curious about and it's just it's about asking maybe like how she how she ended up doing that or um, if you are at a gig and you tend to sort of see someone a million times at a gig and you suddenly see them on stage like how you know just just being um, sort of I, I guess leaning leaning in on your own community because you'd be surprised at, at, at who at who might have some opportunities there for you I think. 
I think it's really. I also crazy. say, I mean, for me, volume. Oh. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go? Okay. No, I was just going to say, for me, obviously, volunteering is kind of what led to my first professional paid experience working in the arts. But then working in the arts, I have been working with volunteers the entire time. Every single festival I've run, I have had hun literally hundreds of volunteers. Some of the volunteers at the Jazz Festival, as an example, had been there longer than any staff member had. And they came back year after year after year. They all were professionals. I had doctors, I had lawyers, I had travel agents. I had people from all kinds of walks of life who loved jazz, who wanted to contribute and felt like the festival was a part of their life. Um, and they had some really amazing experiences. Like I worked directly with a, a lot of people who would look after the artists themselves, pick them up from the airport, drive them around, be there, effectively be their sort of liaison between the festival and, and their own experience. They know artists better than I do and I'm the one who programs them and, you know, worked on it all for a year. So, um, the, the opportunities that you can get as a volunteer, it's not just about having it on your CV, I think, so that you can then get a job in the arts. It's also about what it gives you and what you learn about yourself. Um, and I think that's a really kind of interesting aspect to look at, that it's not just um, people looking for work in the arts who are volunteering, it's people who feel like they are contributing something and getting something back from this connection to arts and culture and what that means for people. So I, you know, I can't wait to have more of an opportunity to volunteer myself um, once things settle down a little bit, but um, I think it's a great way. That's pretty much exactly what I was going to say. Um, Cause I was going to, I was going to talk about community radio, right? Like for me, yes, curating and art stuff, but my, you know, my passion, the thing that I find really is my biggest, motivation and and whatever is working within radio and community the community radio sector in victoria is probably one of the richest in the whole world right like we have the most amazing community radio sector and i think that there's a misconception about like volunteer community radio then you'll get a job at the abc you might even be able to work at channel seven and it's not about that because it's a it's a sector in and of itself and without the community radio sector and i know that you know, actually all three of you, all four of you, including Samira, all the programs that you've done, the jazz festival programs that you've done, Naomi, Claudia with your films and stuff, and the, and the artists that you work with and their music videos. I just imagine that, you know, without the community radio sector, most of this stuff probably wouldn't even get out there in the way that it does, particularly connecting to those communities. And the beauty of community radio is that it is a community. And so when you're 17 and you're like, yeah, you know, I wanna be part of community radio, um, you're then part of this rich history and there are people who are in that space who've been volunteering for a long time, but also paid staff who work there, um, who, you, who will suddenly expose you to the whole world, really, that you may not have had access to, whether it's in arts, whether it's in journalism, whether it's in music, um, you get press releases, you get tickets to staff, and then you're actually doing this work. And I guess if you want to be a journalist and work in radio, it's also... Um, a lot of amazing training that happens, but just respecting the sector as a sector in and of itself is something that I think is really important. Do you, do you want to move on, Samira, or do you want me to answer quickly? Very quickly. Yeah. Um, but I think are... if I'm speaking from the practical, like being the artist, whether you're the musician, the painter, the photographer, the filmmaker, like I, I can't, uh, stress enough to anybody in building folio of your own, you know, putting your head down, ass up and focusing solely on making great work. I can absolutely attest anything that might have been like a milestone in my career being that I just continuously focused on making really good work and people started to notice that. And obviously now we all have, we have social media. So you have your own online portfolio that has the capacity to reach you know, an infinite amount of people. So making good work is the recommendation straight out of high school for the original question. Um, so many questions coming in now through the Q&A and the chat. Unfortunately, though, that we are coming towards the end of our panel. Um, if you have registered for the forums and the workshops, feel free to hold on to those questions and you'll be able to hopefully ask them again later. 
So we are going to go for a bit of a break and have a lunch break, go stretch your legs. Um, and then we're going to come back to the first workshop, which is going to be hosted by uh, Claudia. It's from a spark to an ID that kicks off at 1.30. And then workshop two with Arij, Mel and Naomi, which kicks off at 2.30, imaginative arts programming. Um, looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you for coming and thank you to these gorgeous people uh, for getting to chat. Lots of conversations, so many things to still discuss, but yeah, thank you all. Thanks, Samira. Thank and, if you're, and if you're in this webinar right now and you don't have the Zoom link, it's in the chat. Just make sure that you copy and paste it. Um, that will be the Zoom link for the workshop. It's not the same link for this. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.